Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're going to give it a couple of minutes to fill the room here. Afternoon, everyone. We'll give it just another minute here to fill the room. As we wait for the room to fill, if you don't mind taking the quick poll that we just put up, we would certainly appreciate that. And we'll let this run for about 30 more seconds and get the room filled up and jump right in. Great. Well, thanks everyone for joining us and good afternoon. Um, once again, we'd like to welcome you to our weekly Wednesday webinar series. Today's webinar is on the impact of heavy menstrual bleeding on pelvic health. My name is Brett Spatelli and I'm the Vice President of Advancement here at the National Hemophilia Foundation. At any point during the webinar, if you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We have NHF staff members monitoring these questions, which we will pose to our presenter after the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to the community beginning on Friday, February 5th. I'd like to introduce our presenter today. Lena Vallen is the Director of Education at NHF and a board certified clinical specialist in orthopedic physical therapy. Thank you for taking the time to join us, Lena, and I will now turn things over to you. Thank you so much, Brad, and welcome everybody to our Wednesday webinar series. I'm very delighted and very honored to be able to present on a topic that is extremely dear to my own heart, which is really talking more about pelvic health. Now, I know we have a broad variety of people on our Wednesday webinars, so I really try to make this interesting for everyone. So there will be a little bit of science in here. There will be a lot of other things in here as well. So I hope you will enjoy this next hour with us here. So again, I'm the director of education at NHF, but I'm also a physical therapist by training. And much of my career I've actually spent in the clinic with patients, um, primarily in the ortho realm, as well as the bleeding disorder realm. And I'm here to join, um, to share some of my experiences. So next slide, please. Okay, so. I'm gonna make this go away. Okay, so what we're gonna cover a little bit more today and what we're gonna learn more is the general impact of heavy menstrual bleeding on the quality of life. We'll talk a little bit about that. We'll dive into the anatomy and the functioning of the pelvic girdle and the pelvic floor, something that we're not always talking about in the bleeding disorder world and then really building that connection what um, pelvic floor dysfunctions mean with um, bleeding disorders in women. We'll also introduce a couple of innovative physical therapy assessments for the pelvic floor that you might not have heard about so much. And then we'll take a look at some actionable items at the end for all of us. Next slide, please. So let's start out with thinking a little bit more through women with bleeding disorders. So you might hear a lot about von Willebrand's disease, but there are others as well. So we're talking, including here, carriers of hemophilia A and B, and we really have to make a change here. For many years, historically, we were talking about them just being carriers, being symptomatic carriers, but we really have to change that focus into a person or a patient with hemophilia to receive the same treatment. We are having women with von Willebrand's disease included in this, but there's also rare bleeding disorders as well as inherited platelet defects. So all of this together um, falls into this category where we are looking at bleeding disorders in women 
and then really moving into the pelvic floor as well, because the pelvic floor is impacted in all of these. It doesn't discriminate on the bleeding disorder itself. So let's move forward. Next slide, please. So what is actually happening in women with bleeding disorders? What are some of the symptoms that we often see? And many of you are very familiar with these, but I just wanted to reiterate a couple of points here. So we're seeing menorrhagia. So really that heavy, prolonged menstrual bleeding that happens on a monthly basis. And while we know that a lot of women who have a bleeding disorder experience this, we've also found that there are a lot of women within our general population who have menstrual bleeding and increased menstrual still bleeding though many of these actually do have an underlying bleeding disorder and they are not really aware of this. So this is really where NHF has stepped in a lot more with the Better You Know campaign and has really been driving forward that more women do get their appropriate diagnosis. But then we also have this component of really experiencing pain during that menstrual bleeding. And that is really something that is very important to the pelvic floor. And we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, Eucocutaneous bleeding. And then we're talking about bleeds that are happening in the musculoskeletal system. And we're often talking about joints and muscles here. And most people are thinking more at our extremities, right? Our arms, elbows, knees, ankles. That's what everybody is talking about. But the pelvis area is part of that musculoskeletal system too, a very important one. We're having joints in that area as well, and we're having a lot of muscle structures in this as well. So it is part of that system. And then we are thinking about bleeds that are happening through any metastatic challenges. So surgery, dentistry, childbirth. And childbirth in itself has a huge impact on the pelvic area, not just in women with bleeding disorders, but every woman who goes through that. So just keeping a couple of these in mind and driving that connection. Next slide, please. So the other things that we need to keep in mind is that women with bleeding disorders have certain risk factors of experiencing these at an increased rate. So we're thinking about hemorrhagic ovarian cysts that might occur, some bleeding from the corpus luteum, which is endocrine path in the um, ovaries. We might have a higher incidence of endometriosis. So this is when tissue that is on the inside normally of the uterus is now on the outside. It is very painful to women. We might have some hyperplasia where we have an increase of organ polyps, which are often happening within our GI tract, fibroids, which might be growing within the uterus itself, and then, of course, pregnancy issues and childbirth. We do see an increased risk of these in women with bleeding disorders, but believe it or not, a lot of these have an impact on the musculoskeletal functioning of the pelvis and the pelvic floor, but we don't very often talk about these. So just keep these in mind as we are going through the next slides. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so one of the things that I mentioned in the very beginning is that we really have to take a closer look here at the quality of life in women with bleeding disorders. So there's a lot of research that has been done on this. Um, outside of our bleeding disorder world, but then also within our bleeding disorder world, which is a great start. So what we have actually sadly found is that women have demonstrated a lower quality of life, which are really driven by physical functioning that is not as well as before, role limitations. So a lot of women are not able to fulfill the roles in their life that they would normally play. They might not be able to um, go and do their job. They might not be able and play as much with their children children as they would like to. They might not be able to do the sports and activities that they would like to. They are not unable to fulfill all the roles that they would normally have. And then the big part is really pain. And pain is such a driving factor when it comes to quality of life and decreasing our quality of life. And all of these were really attributed to increased menstrual bleeding. And then that pain that very often accompanies that increased menstrual bleeding and then also pregnancy related bleeding as well. And these were often then also caused by an anemia, um, by fatigue, really being tired. And again, that pain, pain is coming up constantly, which really impacts the quality of life. So we have to think a little bit more about what is it that we can do to increase quality of life. And it's not always stopping by just controlling the bleed, but thinking about all of these other aspects that are triggered along all those secondary issues that come along with increased bleeding. And that is something that we're going to talk a little bit more about. So next slide, please. So obviously this topic is a lot about pelvic health. So I thought it would be important to actually meet the pelvis and learn a little bit more about it. So let's move on to the next slide here, please. 
So a little bit of a clarification, because there's many different terms that are being thrown around when we're talking about the pelvis in itself. So I just wanted to take a moment to really clarify this and really be all on the same page. So for once we have the pelvic girdle, the pelvic girdle is really the bony pelvis. So all the bones and how they are connected. Now within the pelvic girdle, we have the pelvic ring that is being formed. So all of the bones are being connected in the front and in the back. So in the back, they are being connected to the spine, essentially through the sacroiliac joints. And then in the front part, they are being connected by the pubic symphysis, which is our cartilage area. And then that builds that pelvic cavity. And that a pelvic cavity is really that bony basin that holds all of our pelvic organs. And then we're talking about the pelvic floor. And when people hear about the pelvic floor a little bit more, everybody thinks about a muscle, a muscle somewhere down at the bottom that closes everything up, which is actually not quite true. So the pelvic floor is considered a compound structure that closes off the bone, bony pelvic outlet. So when we're thinking about that pelvic girdle that we are having with that wonderful cavity that's holding everything, the pelvic floor is really what closes everything up on the very bottom. It does have a muscular layer to it. And that muscular layer is what we're considering the pelvic floor muscles. It's only one part of your pelvic floor. Now in the rectum, the vagina, the urethra in a woman, they need to actually pass through the pelvic floor and each and every one of them is surrounded by more musculature. Okay, so can you move on to the next slide, please? So I'll show you a little bit of a picture here. So this is what we call the pelvic girdle. It is really that bony structure. We can see the sacrum, which is an extension from our spine. And that sacrum is connected to a bony part, which we will call the enominate. The enominate itself has three parts to it. It has the ilium, it has the pubis, and it has the ischium. They are all connected as well, and they build the nominant. And the nominant itself is then connected to the sacrum in the back, and that connection we call um, the SIJ, so the sacroiliac joint. And then in the front, which you see very in the front, it's that small little connection, which we call the pubic symphysis. We also have a little bony prominence, which we call the coccyx, which is a remnant that we have. So this is when we're looking at a cat or a dog where they would have their tail. We don't have that anymore, but we still have a little bit of a bone and it is a joint connection that we are having there as well. Important to keep in mind. So let's move on to the next slide, please. Very good. Now, what is the function of that bony um, construction here? It's really there to protect our organs, our vessels and our nerves and everything that sits essentially within that pelvic cavity. So when we're thinking about organs, that's really our reproductive organs, our rectum sits there, our bladder. So it's really that bony protection around it so that nothing will happen to these structures. But it also is an attachment site for many muscles and for other soft tissues like ligaments, for example. It also has a functional ability to transfer the load to and from the lower extremity. And then it supports our trunk. It keeps us upright. It keeps us stable. And with this, it's, it's really a protective and support area for the body. So it has to have a lot of stability. Let's move on to the next slide, please. Now, I told you before, when we're talking about the pelvic floor, it is not just one muscle that sits there somewhere on the bottom. It's really a compound structure, an area of the body that closes off the bottom. So when we're looking here, this really includes then on the very outside the perineum, which is the bottom part. And then you have a thin layer there, which are the pelvic floor muscles. Above that, we can see in a woman, the bladder, the uterus and the rectum, which is then lined by the peritoneum on the inside. So again, it is an area of the body. It is not just a little layer of muscles. Let's move on to the next slide. So looking a little bit more closer and diving in into this area, really on the outside, I told you there is the peritoneum, that's the most outer part of it. And that has to be divided into two triangles. Now on the picture here on the right side of your screen, when you're looking at that pelvis, this is actually as if you're looking at a person that's laying down from the bottom up. 
So the top part is essentially the front part of the pelvis and the bottom part of the picture is the back part of the pelvis. Now the front triangle that you are seeing there is the urogenital triangle. And then the back part of it is, um, is the anal triangle. Now all of these provide passage for the urethra and the vagina and the rectum. It's important to keep these triangles in mind as we are moving on forward because they are important locations. So let's move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so again, that pelvic floor, as I told you, it's not just one muscle, it is a beautiful area that is actually very complex. So it does have different layers and we're subdividing it into three layers. Now we are also calling these pouches and then the muscles themselves are different muscles within each of these layers. I'm not going to go into great detail of depicting out each and every muscle because that would really extend this presentation by hours. So let me just explain to you there are three different layers that you really need to be aware of. The most outer layer, the superficial perineal pouch holds the perineum that we just talked about. And then it has some of the muscles of the urogenital and anal triangle. Those were those two triangles that I showed you. And then a genitalia gland. So they are on the most outside part of it. Then there is a second layer within um, the pelvic floor pouch. So that's the deep perineal pouch or also or genital diaphragm. And this holds another layer of muscles. So these are the, the rest of the orogenital triangle muscles. And then there's a third layer. So the third layer is most on the inside. So this is the pelvic diaphragm, we call it. This holds the levator ani, and there are two muscles to this which is really closing off your anus, um, another muscle called the coccygeus, and then really the pelvic wall, which is the most inside part of it. And the pelvic wall is constructed of another muscle groups, so the piriformis and obturator internus, that's what they are called. And they built that connection from the pelvis to the hips and then into the lower extremities. Now, why is this important? Now, if you're having some issues in your hips, if either if your hip muscles are very weak or if they are very tight, that can actually influence the pelvic floor stability. Next slide, please. So what is really important here is to understand that this entire pelvic floor is not just one muscle, it's a whole complex structure. And we need this complex structure because it needs to fulfill different functions. So when we're looking at the pelvic floor, what we're asking our pelvic floor to do is to support us, to really build that support for our organs, for our stability in there. We also need to have a sphincteric function, which is really that closure, the closure of the urethra, so where your urine comes out, the closure of your rectum, where your fecal matter comes out. And then we're having a sexual function in here as well. And then our pelvic floor also has a functioning of circulatory and lymphatic area. So as I said before, there are many different vessels that are traveling through the pelvic floor. And by constricting the pelvic floor, so by tightening those muscles, we are helping our circular system really moving fluid through. So with that being said, we are asking a lot of different things from our pelvic floor muscles. So they don't just need to contract to move something. It's not an arm that we are just moving. It needs to wear very many different hats. So they need to be able to maintain and sustain a resting tone. So there's always a little bit of tone in your pelvic floor so that you're not losing urine or that you are not losing fecal matter, right? So when we're sleeping, when we're walking around, we actually can maintain that tone so that nothing comes out. So at the same time, we also need these little quick contractions and we use these normally to maintain our continence, but then also doing sexual functions. So think about this, you have a really full bladder and you need to run to the bathroom and somebody's blocking the bathroom and you're waiting in line for that person to come out, right? So you're squeezing everything together and trying to hold everything in. Those are the quick contractions in order to maintain your continence. Now, on the flip side, you also ask your pelvic floor to relax, right? So once that person comes out of the bathroom and you can finally go, you need to sit down. And then in that moment, everything needs to relax so that everything can come out. So 
when we are evaluating the pelvic floor, we can't just ask like, oh, can you, can you contract? Can you tighten your pelvic floor? No, we need to assess different components because the pelvic floor is wearing so many different heads and needs to do so many different things for us. So we need to assess its power. How much can the muscles actually contract? We need to ask for endurance. How long can they contract? How long can they maintain that contraction? We need to see how fast can they contract? What's the speed? And then really, again, that ability to relax. So again, the pelvic floor is doing a lot of wonderful things for us and we need to assess it accordingly. Next slide, please. Okay, now, so what is the connection here? So we're talking about bleeding disorders, we're talking about pelvic health, but let's bring these a little bit together. So when we look at women with bleeding disorders, we know we have increased menstrual bleeding. And most often this increased menstrual bleeding is associated with an experience of pain. Now, if this experience of pain is prolonged, that is a problem for the body. And then we have all of these additional factors that I mentioned in the very beginning too, of especially thinking here about endometriosis, polyps, fibroids, and then of course, pregnancy issues and childbirth. All of these, can easily lead to pelvic floor dysfunctions, meaning our pelvic floor is not able to fulfill all these different job requirements that we are asking of it to do. So we know this a lot from mainstream physical therapy. So from the physical therapy that is happening outside of the bleeding disorder world, but we're not so much talking about it here. So I'm really asking you, when was the last time you've actually talked to your provider about pelvic floor dysfunction? Probably not so much. So let's think about this a little bit more. So let's move on to the next slide, please. Here. So what is a pelvic floor dysfunction and what do we normally see? So when we are thinking about what is actually happening from increased bleeding, pain with increased bleeding, and then all of these other components, what well, we are often seeing in the pelvic floor is then that the pelvic floor might be underactive. So underactivity of the pelvic floor is when your muscles get actually weak. So we often see this then when people have incontinence or they have a pelvic organ prolapse. And here's an interesting fact for you. Many women don't even know they have a pelvic organ prolapse. They get diagnosed in the very late stages when they start to feel it. But when we have actually gone in and assessed them, we found that many people experience this. So this is really when the muscles are just weak, they're not able to give us that stability and hold everything up and stabilize everything. Now on the flip side, we might also have an overactive pelvic floor. So this is when everything gets super tight, much tighter than it should be. Now this is often seen with pelvic pain and these people will have issues emptying their bladder or their bowels. So when they are going to the bathroom and they try to relax, it's really hard to come out but they might also have constipation and straining. This is what we often see in women who have prolonged um, pain, who have prolonged bleeding episodes. So with the pain, what happens very often is that everything tightens around it. There's this constriction response in, um, to the pain experience. And very often if this experience is prolonged, we will see an overactive pelvic floor in people. And often this is then depicted in pain. So what we also see is what we call um, the synergic. So this is essentially an uncoordinated muscle. So within the pelvic floor, we have a left and a right pelvic floor, but we cannot separately contract them. Whereas in, in other bodies, we can move our left arm, we can move our right arm, but with the pelvic floor, if we're contracting them, everything contracts. So when we have a dyssynergic uh, pelvic floor, we, we don't have that symmetry anymore. And it really becomes this paradoxical contraction. Something might contract, something other might not contract as much. And then we have the non-functioning pelvic floor. So this often happens when we have some neuromotor impairment. So it might be a nerve that got injured, for example. It's really when we don't have a voluntary or non-voluntary contraction anymore. Essentially, no one can hold anything anymore in that moment. But here's the inter interesting thing. Your patients normally don't come to you and be like, oh, I have an overactive pelvic floor. Or so they come with very particular symptoms. So most often the patients that I have personally seen, they come actually in for musculoskeletal pain. So they are experiencing pain and that pain might not even be in the pelvis. The most people that I have seen come through the door, they had mostly low back pain 
or they had hip pain. That's what they were sent in with. And then we would go in and do an um, assessment of them and find, okay, there's actually nothing really wrong with the low back or there's nothing really wrong with the hips, but it's really going into the pelvis. But that is not necessarily where people are experiencing the pain. Low back pain is really notorious for this. So then the other symptoms that most people are reporting is frequent urination. So people have to run to the toilet constantly. And then it's also continence issues. And this is so funny because we often talk about this and assume so many things to be normal. How many of you who have had children have heard this phrase of like, oh, you know, I've had kids. And now when I laugh, I use a little bit of urine or when I sneeze, there's a little bit of urine and a couple of drops coming out. And now that's totally normal. We all experience that, right? It's actually not normal. And there's something that we can do about it. And that's the important part. Now, other things that patients might present with is constipation and straining. And people might assume, oh, it's maybe what I'm eating. I'm not drinking enough water. But it might actually be a dysfunction of the pelvic floor that is not allowing enough fecal matter to come out, which then is causing that constipation. And then it comes straining with that too. It's just too tight. It's not letting loose. It's not really letting everything come out. Um, along with that, which we often see in an overactive pelvic floor, is really then urinary retention or change in the stream. So patients might actually tell like, you know, I was going to the bathroom and all of a sudden my urine is just dribbling out. It's not coming out in a normal stream anymore. And then I have to go constantly too, because I can't really empty my whole bladder. So that's often what we see too. And then what patients might disclose, but where you might have to ask a little bit more as a provider is pain with intercourse. So that is also not normal. And it might be due to a pelvic floor dysfunction. So that is what we're seeing in a lot of women as well. Next slide, please. So I want to dive a little bit into PT-related assessments. We normally do a very thorough musculoskeletal assessment, but then when we're talking about pelvic health, there are a couple of really great techniques that I wanted to introduce and wanted to showcase a little bit more. Next slide, please. So one of my personal loves, and, and for some of you who know this, is I, I have been very much involved with musculoskeletal ultrasound within the bleeding disorder world, but musculoskeletal ultrasound is not only used for that. There are many other techniques. And in the physical therapy that we are doing outside of the bleeding disorder world, we have used musculoskeletal ultrasound a lot in pelvic health for a long time. So one way we're using this now is really to get a little bit of a better idea of the muscle architecture and the ability or inability of the muscles to actually contract and then also the timing. We can all see that on the screen and the beautiful piece of muscus is that it's real time, right? We can, we can visualize it and then on the screen we can see whether or not somebody is actually contracting. What we have also found in research is that it's much more specific in understanding that contraction and in an assessment of the pelvic floor con uh, contraction timing than a palpation and internal palpation will do. And we have two different ways of doing that. We can do a transabdominal ultrasound, so through the belly, or we can do a transperineal ultrasound where we are really going um, into the private area a little bit more. And I'll show you examples of this. But what we've also found, and, and this is such a great validation of this, is that the morphology and the activity that we're seeing with muscus in these, that it is the same in MRIs and EMGs. So it's really been confirmed. The problem that we are having with musculoskeletal ultrasound is that we can really not quantify the strength here. We can see that something is contracting. We can maybe see a little bit with how much that is, but we can't really grade it. There's no way of grading the amount of power that is there and um, the lift as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so I wanted to showcase those two different techniques that we are using. The first one is the transperineal ultrasound. So for this, the bladder actually should be empty and the patient will be positioned kind of in the same position as you would have with your OBGYN. So that gives us very good access to that area. Now the transducer is then placed um, at uh, the perineum, along the perineum. And what we are trying to depict are here, which you can see in the images on the right side, is really the pubic symphysis and the proximal junction of the bladder neck. 
antiurethra. So that is what we want to have in our picture, which you can also see on the right. So that gives us then an indication of an angle that we like to measure, which is called the anorectal angle. It's really that area. And the way we're measuring it and, um, gives us a little bit of an indication of how strong or how much that pelvic floor can actually contract. There is a standard formula that we use to calculate ladies and we have a lot of normative data that we can uh, connect this to. Next slide, please. Now, another component that we have here is really the transabdominal ultrasound. And this has become really popular because it's the least invasive technique, right? So we don't need to go really in that private area of a person. We can do this through the belly. And a lot of people prefer this technique. So this um, position is really when the patient is in supine, so they are laying on their back. And um, we can then place the transducer either in a long axis, which you can see on the bottom picture, or in a transverse axis, which you can see in the top picture there. Now for this, the patient to kind of um, streamline a little bit of how full the bladder should be, normally the recommendation is to void about an hour before and then to drink a little bit of water again after. It's just to streamline a little bit how, um, how much there should be in the bladder. And then what we really want to visualize, you can see in the picture on the right side is the bladder and then the pelvic floor area underneath it. And what we're measuring here is the displacement of the bladder. So we will take an image um, during relaxation and then we have the person lift again. And then um, we are measuring essentially the um, difference between those two. And then we have some normative data on this as well for men and for women, for both of them. So we can actually do a comparison there. Again, it is the preferred technique by many just because it is less invasive. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so another technique that we often use is the surface EMG. So this is not the type of EMG where we are sticking needles into people. We can really do this on the surface. And for this, we would um, place little electrodes in the perineal area as well. And what we are measuring is really that action potential. So what we wanna see is, are the muscles contracting and how fast are they contracting? So what is the timing of the muscle contraction and what's the actual action that is happening here? However, again, similar as with the muscles, we cannot really quantify the strength. We can see that they're um, active and we can see the timing, but we cannot really grade the strength per se. Now we're looking at a couple of different things here. So again, remember that pelvic floor is um, really asked to wear many different heads. So when we are assessing this, we need to measure different things so that we can really have an overall view. So we're starting out with the resting level, which is at baseline, um, just seeing what the resting contraction here is. And then we have the patients do rapid contractions. So just quickly contract your pelvic floor and we see whether or not these fibers engage. We then also have a long contraction to see what is that recruitment of slow twitch fibers and how long can they hold this? So we have somebody, okay, contract and now hold, 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 hold. Then we have somebody do a submaximal contraction. So tighten your pelvic floor as much as you possibly can. And then of course that relaxation. Now, the wonderful thing that we can do with EMG, and we can do it similarly with the musculoskeletal ultrasound as well, is that we can use it as a biofeedback mechanism. So believe it or not, many people think like, oh yeah, I totally know how to contract my pelvic floor, but it's actually not that easy. So when we're doing investigations, there's a couple of great studies on this as well, who have found that many people are pulling in accessory muscles in order to contract their pelvic floor. So those accessory muscles are often our belly, our abdominals, our glutes, so our buttocks or our thighs that we are activating. So think again about that situation where you have a really full bladder and you're standing in front of that bathroom that somebody is blocking and you're just tightening everything. You're probably not just tightening your floor in that very moment. You will, you will tense your buttocks, you will tense your belly and everything else that you possibly could recruit to hold that urine in, right? But when we're actually training the pelvic floor, we don't want all of those muscles to kick in as well. So this is where we can use these great techniques too, to teach somebody, this is really how you're contracting the floor. And we often put some imagery with this too, like 
Think about an umbrella opening and closing. Think about a flower is what some people say. What I found too that helps a lot is a jellyfish, kind of a jellyfish image that you might have. So we use this for up training, so strengthening, for down training, relaxing, and then really that coordination training of like really contracting the muscles together. So this is one technique that we also use to give us a little bit more of a quantifiable understanding of how much the muscles um, really when they contract and if they are contracting. Next slide, please. So then what we are doing, which is um, kind of the last one in this here, is an internal exam. And this is where everybody gets like their big alarms and it's like, oh my God, what are you doing, right? But it's not like a internal exam that you would expect from your OBGYN. It's not like a deep pelvic exam. We're really just palpating on the inside to feel a little bit more what the muscles feel like. What is their tone? It also gives us a good idea of testing sensation. So think back at the very beginning of this presentation where I said like there might be some nerves that get damaged. So we can actually assess that with our sensation a little bit more too. And then we can also look a little bit more for symmetry. We can look for the volume of it. We can palpate for some trigger and tender points that we might have. So when I'm pushing on certain areas, does that actually hurt you? We can look if there are any restrictions within the tissue, look for sizes. And this also helps us to stage a little bit more the organ prolapse. So remember, a lot of women don't even know that they are experiencing a prolapse. And then it gives us a good indication to confirm the pelvic floor muscle contraction, that relaxation, and the upward lift displacement. So by feeling that, I can confirm what I might have seen with my other assessment um, things. The important part here, this should really be done by a PT who has undergone that appropriate professional training. It is an extension of our training that we receive in um, the university, but it really should be done by a pelvic PT who has undergone that appropriate education. Now, next slide, please. Okay, so this is the important part of what does that actually mean for you? Why is this topic important? And why are we spending a Wednesday webinar to actually talk about all of this, right? So it is a topic that doesn't get discussed that often. So when we're even looking in the literature that's out there, all the literature we have on pelvic health is really coming from other areas. It's not coming from within the bleeding or um, disorder world. So we haven't really looked at that. Now, the interesting part though is that the symptoms we are seeing in women with bleeding disorders are the same that we're seeing outside and in pelvic health. So why would not be the same issues here within our community that we see in other areas? And it's really time to think about this and it's really time to start talking about this more. Next slide, please. So let's really start to take action. Let's take this as an opportunity to provide good holistic care and to open the conversation about these issues. So very often, we don't really talk about things that are happening below the belly button. It is a taboo topic for many people and it's time to talk more about this. So for consumers, very often, if you're a patient, if you have a bleeding disorder and you think you are experiencing some symptoms of um, that you're experiencing more musculoskeletal pain, that you're experiencing some incontinence or having some issues with even being able to go to the bathroom, if you're experiencing any pain with intercourse, don't assume that is normal. Start talking about it with your provider. Start bringing these issues up because the beautiful part is there's also maybe something that can be done about this, but it's important that we actually start to have that conversation. So don't assume that your symptoms are normal and start to talk to your provider about this. Now, if you are a healthcare provider and you're working at a hemophilia treatment center or engage with other patients, start that conversation too. Talk to your patients about pelvic health. It doesn't mean you're turning into an OBGYN, but it just means a little quick conversation of like, well, how are you doing? Are there any issues? And maybe ask about specific signs and symptoms about pelvic floor dysfunction. Most people don't even know they are having a pelvic floor dysfunction to begin with because they are showing up with different symptoms. Think back about what I said in the beginning of that many women are showing up to the clinic with low back pain, hip pain, pain somewhere else that they built not a connection to the pelvic floor. But at the end of the day, it is a pelvic floor dysfunction. Again, it doesn't mean that you're starting to treat this. It is just opening up the conversation. 
and then really connect with your physical therapist. Your physical therapist might not be trained in all of this. So then really make sure you can provide the appropriate referral. And that referral can pull in an OBGYN. It can pull in a PT that is trained in this. And it really needs to become this interdisciplinary team that is connecting different providers that can provide great care for this and can maybe improve some of the symptoms that you are experiencing. And then it's really a call to action to research too. As I said before, there isn't really a lot out there, but yet we have those symptoms that we know cause certain pelvic health issues um, outside of the bleeding disorder world. So they will cause the same inside the bleeding disorder world. So it would be great to collect some more data on this, look at the epidemiology, and then really look at all the different techniques and treatments that we have um, and how they would actually help our women with bleeding disorders and their experiences. So very easily there can be um, some great tools, some great techniques that can help you feel a little bit more better and improve your pain experience and improve your overall quality of life. Next slide, please. So there are a couple of resources that we have for diagnosed women with um, bleeding disorders. So really make sure you take a look at these as well. So one is our NHF Victory for Women. We have our Steps for Living and we are actually in the process of really updating this as well. There's also the Foundation for Women and Girls with Bleeding Disorders. And then as I've mentioned before, we have this large campaign to really um, drive people who have not been diagnosed with bleeding disorders to receiving their appropriate diagnosis and then even more so receiving the treatment that they deserve that will increase their quality of life. Next slide, please. So with all of this, I would really like to thank you from the bottom of my heart um, for spending a little bit of time with me and listening to this. I really hope you found some value in this material and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Great, thanks so much, Lena. We do have a few questions that, that came in and I think there's some really good ones. This has been a, a lot of information, so I'm excited to, to ask these of you. Um, first question comes in, how do we gain evidence or data to support physio, physio and PT care for pelvic health and get this published, knowing there is a huge gap in articles and information in this area? Yeah, I think that is a, a really great question. So the interesting part is we do have a lot of data and published articles on physical therapy for pelvic health. So just as a background, um, within the physical therapy world, we have different areas that we focus on. So there's orthopedics, there's acute care and so forth. And one of those areas is pelvic health. So it is a specialty within physical therapy that's evidence-based driven. So there's a lot of um, research that has been published uh, over many, many years on the efficacy, effectiveness of the treatment of physical therapy for pelvic health. So it's all there. Um, we haven't really done that in the bleeding disorder world. And this is where my last slide really came in here, that that is something we need to look more into. So if anybody out there is interested in partnering with me or really getting some ideas, let me know. Um, but I think it is something to be worth looking into because it's the same symptoms, right? It's the same symptoms we are seeing um, in our outside world, outside the bleeding disorder bubble world. And um, we're not really talking that much in our world here. And it's really important that we pull this information that's happening there and that research that's happening there into our world as well and see how all of this can truly benefit our patients. Great, great. Thanks so much. Lena. Another one question that came in. Um, what if your pelvic floor has been damaged over a long time due to misdiagnosis or lack of treatment? If someone's pelvic floor is weak, does this mean they'll never be able to have children? Can the damage be repaired? No, 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 no. So it depends a little bit on what it is. And that would need to undergo um, a little bit more of a medical assessment in that moment of what that damage actually is. Um, there is, are wonderful treatments to really reactivate that pelvic floor. And it depends a little bit if that is just a weakness and we need to really train those muscles. Um, then we can do that. So many people have, this is always the funny part, many people have heard about Kegel exercises, right? And very often when people have had damages, you get this little handout and be like, yeah, do these, whatever you think about it, it will help you. It, it's not as easy as that. 
So we really need to go in and um, see an educated provider on this who has been trained in this to really go through and learn how to activate the pelvic floor correctly. And then think about this, it is a muscle. You can train a muscle. If a muscle is weak, you can strengthen a muscle. However, um, we really need to think about what the underlying issue there is. Now, if it's a nerve that is impacting this, that's a different story, right? But we have different treatment pathways within physical therapy to really help somebody um, strengthen those again, get that stability back again, and, and um, really uh, fix the pelvic floor. But again, it, it depends a little bit on, on what the ultimate diagnosis is for this. But there are many different ways of, of doing this. Now, would that prevent you from having children? No. Um, normally not. You can you can still have children even with a weakened uh, pelvic floor, and most people have without even knowing. So as I said before, there's so many people that are running around and walking around with a weakened pelvic floor, and many of them have children too. Or think about the people who have had a child, have had some pelvic floor damage, and then they have more children thereafter. It shouldn't really prevent you from it. However, it is important that you connect with your medical provider on that because there needs to be a diagnosis with this as well. There needs to be a thorough assessment of what um, the causation of it is. And then it needs to be investigated of what the best path for fixing the pelvic floor is. Great. Thanks, Lena. Next question comes in. Do you see some of these symptoms in adolescent girls with heavy menstrual cycles? Yes, we actually see um, these in young, uh, young girls uh, very often when um, on different avenues. So we see them in young girls who have heavy menstrual bleeding um, and there it very often comes in as an overactive pelvic floor. So it's really that tightening, that tenseness. We also see this a lot in young girls who are very active in athletes. We see this very often in athletic girls happening. I just read a study the other day that was looking into cheerleaders where they found that very often as well. So we see it much more frequently than we think it is actually happening. As a little caveat, we have seen pelvic floor dysfunction in, even in children. So there's often an underlying condition there, but we see pelvic floor functioning even to be a problem in young kids as well. Great. Um, here's a great question, Mina, and I think um, you'll be able to shed some light on for us. Um, so many of us women with bleeding disorders, and even those without bleeding disorders, think that bladder leakage is normal. And mm -hmm. while, we, while we all talk and joke sometimes to our friends about it, how do we talk to our providers about it? They aren't, yeah. they aren't bringing, them, bringing these questions up in office visits. And can we ask for a referral to a physical therapy or is this a specialist field? Yeah. So let me tell you this first. Thank you so much for bringing up this question, because this is something that so many people say, right? We're sitting together, we're joking around. It's like, oh, yeah, I just sneezed. And there's a little bit of urine that comes out. We often hear that, especially from women who have had children. It's like, oh, yeah, my pelvic floor got really weak, too, after I've had two kids. And now whenever I laugh or sneeze, there's a little bit of urine coming out or a lot of urine coming out. And, and we all think because everybody or so many people in our field have that same experience, we automatically assume that's normal, right? But it's not normal. It isn't, right? And there's something that we can do about this. Now, this brings me then to the second part of your question is really how do we talk about this? So I think a first step is really when you're talking to, um, let's say you are having your appointment with your hematology provider, bring that symptom up and talk to them about it. Say, I'm having a lot of urine leakage. Is there something um, that I should see somebody about. They might uh, send you on to an OBGYN. So this is also something that you can bring up at your OBGYN um, annual exam whenever you have an appointment about this. And um, what they will often do then is to refer you over to a pelvic health physical therapist. So this is a specialty in itself. It's not your normal standard outpatient PT practice. It is a uh, PT that is specialized in this, and they can do then the assessment of where that is coming from and um, what is actually actually happening with the pelvic floor. Now they have actually revised a lot of the guidelines with an um, uh, gynecology OBGYN area where they have to refer out to a physical therapist first as a non or non-surgical intervention. So um, that would be your 
your best first step. But I think the most important part is to start talking about it. And this is always the issue comes up because we don't talk about it because we assume it's normal. And then very often we talk to those people that are close about it because it's that conversation about an area that is below the belly button. So who do we normally talk to this about? We talk to our our mothers, our aunts, maybe a sister, maybe a very close friend. And they might actually have exactly the same situation. As you said, we are sitting all around and we're talking about the same thing and everybody is having the same. So the assumption is that it's normal. But I think the first step is really to start the conversation. If, um, and to, to really bring that issue up and bring the symptom up and um, to stand your ground that this is not normal. And I've heard that I can do something about this and I want to do something about this. And there are different ways you can take from there. Yeah. Thanks, Lena. Another question comes in. Can bleeding disorders cause pelvic floor dysfunction or is the dysfunction present and made worse by a bleeding disorder? Both. <laughs> so it, dep <laughs> it depends, right? It's this. It depends answer that's um, never really black and white. It depends on the person and what they are going through. Now, let's say you're a person with a bleeding disorder that has very heavy menstrual bleeding and a lot of pain associated with it. And all of that can then really disrupt the pelvic floor and cause a pelvic floor dysfunction. Now, let's say you're having a pelvic floor dysfunction already having a bleeding disorder on top of it is definitely not making it easier and it can certainly make it worse. So it's almost this catch 22 that you're running around in a circle and it really depends on the person and it depends what their body is going through and um, what the underlying diagnosis is. Great. Um, another question comes in, man. In all my years of going to an OBGYN and having two babies, my provider, knowing that I am a carrier of hemophilia, has never asked me about pelvic floor dysfunction or any questions in this area. What questions should we be asking when we go to our providers? Mm -hmm. That is a very good point. And um, you are, first of all, you're not alone. And it's not just people with bleeding disorders, but it's a lot of women in general that do not have these conversations with their providers and where their providers are not asking questions either. So um, I think a start is if you're having problems, if you're having any symptoms to really bring these up, ask your provider. I'm having a lot of pain in my pelvic area, in my low back. I'm leaking a lot of urine. I'm having a really hard time going to the bathroom. I'm having pain with intercourse. Is there something we can do about this? So it's really important that you bring up the symptoms to your provider and then ask them, I've heard that there might be something I can do about this. Could you please give me a referral to a physical therapist um, who specialized in pelvic health. I can also tell you that uh, physical therapists have direct access. So you could go to a PT without a referral as well. I don't know if everybody knows this, but you can go without a referral to begin with. But I think the, the biggest conversation starter truly is telling your OBGYN that you do have symptoms and that you want to do something about this because it's impacting your quality of life. Great. Thank you. Another question that came in. Uh, can your pelvic floor issue change over time? Could you go from underactive, overactive to non-functioning over the course of your life? Or is it usually one ongoing issue? No, it can change. It again, it depends. It depends what your body is going through, but it can it can definitely change over the course of a lifetime, and it really will depend on the experiences that you are having. It changes a lot when, um, you know, let's say you're you're having an overactive one when you're younger, then you might have children, which will further impact your pelvic floor. Maybe it becomes a little bit weaker after that. Um, let's say you have another child and during childbirth, maybe you um, kink one of the nerves a little bit and now um, you're not having a contraction anymore. So it depends a little bit on the life events that you have, but yes, you can definitely change throughout your lifetime. Great. Um, another question that comes in, um, is vaginismus related to an overactive pelvic in girls with bleeding disorders? Yes. I'm sorry, that's a short answer. So uh, um, vaginitis is really that over, 
um, overactive pelvic floor that's happening. So everything is tightening up, everything is getting tense and um, uh, too, uh, too tight essentially, which is causing that pain. And um, this is really then due again to an overactive pelvic floor. Do we see this a lot in young women, young adolescents? Yes, absolutely. And um, some of that connection is again, think about that menstrual bleeding that is happening. Um, that increased menstrual bleeding. And then that increased menstrual bleeding is often associated with pain. The reaction of pain in your musculoskeletal system is really a tightening of all the muscles, a tensioning of all the muscles to really protect your body. So when pain is being signaled up to your brain, um, your brain's first instinct is really protection. It needs to protect the area where that signal is coming from. And that boils back to our fight or flight situation. But what the brain then sends down is like tighten everything up, tense in everything. Now think about this when, as you're starting to menstruate, very often your menstruation is a little bit more regular. It's often very heavy. We see that in a lot of young women. And then you are having that every month, right? It is not just a one-time event that then, magically goes away and everything is okay. It is a monthly occurrence. So a monthly occurrence with like heavy prolonged bleeding, heavy prolonged pain associated with it, heavy prolonged signals from the pelvic area to the brain that there is a lot of things going on and a lot of pain is being signaled back. A lot of tension is getting signaled back. At some point in time, the pelvic floor will just stay tightened. It will just stay tensed up. And that is really what's leading to that overactive um, pelvic floor in that moment. And that can cause that pain a lot in young women then as well. And as I said earlier, we don't just see that in women with bleeding disorders, but we see that in young women in general, also with young women who are very athletic, who are involved in a lot of sports. Um, we see that very often there as well. Great. Uh, Lena, we have one more question, time for one more question. And I think this is a good one to kind of uh, wrap things up. Um, this is, it says, is there something published by NHF or other organizations that gives a list of questions, signs, and symptoms we could be asking our healthcare providers about the issues with the pelvic health dysfunction? There's nothing published by NHF right now, but um, there are some things published on APTA. So that's the American Physical Therapy Association website. They have a couple of information of what patients can ask their providers on this. Um, so that would be my, my first go-to in that very moment. Great. Great. Well, so I'd like to thank you, Lena, for taking the time to join us this afternoon. We, we certainly appreciate your time and your expertise. Um, and I'd also like to thank each one of you for joining us. Uh, please note that this recorded webinar will be available by Friday, February 5th at hemophilia.org under the events tab with all of our archive webinars. Also available in the events tab is our upcoming schedule for our weekly Wednesday webinar series. Thank you for joining us again and everyone have a wonderful after afternoon. Thanks, Lena. Thank you.